Uh, this is my version of it. It's actually about addressing the world of preventing people from harming their lives, from uh, stopping waste, waste of lives, and actually thinking about opening possibilities. Ultimately, there are no simple answers. People's lives are complicated. You get on a false start at the age of three or four or five, and that false start in life, family breakup, whatever, um, can, repair, can return again and again in your life. So actually what we require, I think, is a notion of public health which begins with making sure that families are safe, that communities are safe, that we deal with inequalities in the communities, and stop the cycle of one generation having problems and passing on to the next. How was it that people are living longer lives? Better nutrition, cleaner streets, cleaner environments, new technologies like soap, you know, about a cleaner world. It's about building the Thames embankment, having fresh water instead of water being drawn from the Thames. And these things didn't happen overnight. There were people fighting for them. Actually, it was an all-out war to get the finances to improve the, the, the drainage and sewer. Um, arrangements in Britain. Back in the 1940s, it's a wonderful sign here, um, penicillin cures gonorrhea in four hours, it says. <laughs> and it did. The funny thing is, what you have today is the declining effectiveness of uh, antibiotics. Back in the 1940s and 50s, when they were first introduced, they were p far more effective uh, then than now because there weren't antibiotics already within the, within the population. They were simply much more effective drugs. Their effectiveness is declining rapidly. Actually, it was worse in the past. Uh, this is a, a wonderful picture by William Hogarth, the artist, and this is the picture of Gin Lane in 1751. And what happened was we had a, a Dutch king who brought over gin, and it was freely available almost at every street corner, and there was an epidemic of gin drinking, and that was the way society was depicted. How to solve this problem? Well, Hogarth invented uh, arm minimization, and his was his solution to the problem of, of binge drinking on the streets of wherever in Britain. Beer Street. The solution to the problem of gin was giving out beer, right? And the first really national harm minimization policy was drinking beer. And actually it was sensible. I, just to explain, if anybody's read Dickens here, you had a world in which the water is undrinkable, uh, beer is the only drinkable, low alcohol beer is what all members of the community drank. So it wasn't such a stupid policy. It actually came into law uh, in the Beer House Act. Uh, there were 30,000 new beer licenses issued, and this was a great harm reduction policy of the day, but actually, in this depiction of it, pretty well everybody in the picture is drunk because they've done... <laughs> the solution, which was opening beer, was that companies were in competition to get stronger beers, and the whole circumstance changes again. Well, what we know doesn't work is criminalization. And uh, I used to work in the States some years ago, and if you look at the data today in the States, it is quite an appalling world that they have created for themselves. One person in four in the US is prison for drug offences, such as the rise of incarcerated Americans, that there are now the same number of people in for drug offences, the same as the entire population of people in prison uh, in 1980. And there are more people, more of people of a black and Latino background in prison of that age group than there are in higher education. Okay? It's a worth, I mean, what a thought. What a waste. Because this is such an appalling policy format. A moralizing policy which doesn't look at harm, which actually creates harm. And what I've noticed in doing research here with service users is the amount of people that um, may have been using for a long time, may have been in touch with drug and alcohol <laughs> services for a long time, and haven't been tested, or may have only been tested a decade or so ago. You know, I'm wondering why this is. And one of the reasons why it might be is the way the testing is offered and NTA requirements such as this hepatologist says. So, you know, and um, the that's, that it seems it can be about just ticking a box so that testing can be offered in a very cursory manner. And this isn't helped by those long, complex forms that drug and alcohol workers have to fill out, which doesn't give time for the conversation to happen around hepatitis C, which needs to happen so service users can ask questions. 
Now another interesting reason why this conversation doesn't happen, I heard from service providers, is they don't want to expose how little they know. You know, and I think that's something you should uh, take home with you, that service providers don't want to talk about hep C because they don't know that much about it. <laughs> Now I don't actually hear a lot of talk about feeling entitled to or empowerment or having a right to treatment from service users. And so there are some obvious reasons for this. You know, as drug users, we've experienced sustained marginalisation and discrimination and we may have internalised some of those experiences <coughs> to feel like we're not worth it. Or in feeling like we're worth it and trying, having come up against so many barriers that we just can't try anymore. Quality hepatitis C testing and treatment for service users is a right and should be advocated for as such. There are some really great doctors, nurses and drug and alcohol workers involved in hep C treatment and care for service users out there, but there are also many that couldn't care less. This needs to change and can only be done with some collective mobilisation from the service user network. Effective action need not be momentous. Um, it can happen on an individual basis. It can be things like engaging your key worker in a conversation about hepatitis C. Get them to expose those knowledge deficits. Get them to go and get some training. And also be proactive about asking for your needs to be met. I have heard stories of, of people going to hospital and them saying, if you use drugs, it's going to have negative effects of the interferon treatment. This is not true. Okay? That is not true. Actually, having a bit of heroin could, could really help when, when you're on hep C treatment. No, I mean, it's a bit of a shit treatment, right? <laughs> And also, being on methadone, perfect time to do it. A lot of people on methadone cope better than people who are not on methadone. And also, it's time for us to stand together, make hepatitis C a priority, and, you know, and let's get rid of the stereotype of service users as being apolitical and passive. We can do better, and look at you all here. I just want to say that hepatitis C is an important issue, and it's often not seen as an important issue because it mainly affects people who inject drugs. Okay? But, you know, people who inject drugs have rights too. Alright? So... <laughs> Harm reduction is a systematic means of seizing opportunities that maximise benefits to everybody. This isn't about little interventions, this is about a systematic approach that is crime reduction, that is reduction in harms around health, that is reduction in budgets, which as commissioners moving to local authority is a big thing and the reason we've been able to do the work we're doing is because they see that if we can do sort of cost effective interventions with alcohol users, with vulnerable people, that stops the impact on the NHS budgets, so if we can support somebody, so they don't go and use the A&E to GP surgery and cost them 80 quid a time, then they're going to want to back us. So people who come to us, we're working on their time, on their territory, on their terms. If they don't want to talk about booze or have people foist interventions on them, they don't have to. If they want to get pissed and watch Jeremy Kyle, as long as they put something on the end of it, they can. <laughs> Um, but if they do want the help and they do want the support, then we'll do that for them. And I think what the data of scenes, I say, so if someone's coming in and drinking, we've got a lot of um, Polish street drinkers. <laughs> they start on the vodka, man, it's funny. But <laughs> in a weird political climate at the minute, we are at a place where people are worried about what's going to happen about the work they're doing, the work they're believing. But I do believe you can sort of seize the opportunity and you can do effective work if you have that mindset and don't just look at things as like one-off interventions. And um, yeah, and wet rooms do work, they're not just there for people to get drunk in, they can, and what's wrong with that, to keep people off the streets. And um, as Mr Cameron says yesterday, I've got to speak somewhere, I mean, he, didn't, he didn't mention the, the impact on, on lives and health yesterday, but yeah, you know, we can keep people out of police stations, we can keep people out of hospital, we can keep them off the street, we can reduce the fear of crime. When we got there, I opened one bottle and I started thinking back to Jasmine, that time in her car. Half the bottle was drank and I turned around to my partner and said, that's it now, enough is enough. I'm not drinking anymore. Of course, and rightfully so, she never believed me. She had heard it all before, but from that night up until this day, I haven't drank again.
tough, I have had cravings, but I've managed to keep focused on what I want to achieve, and that was using my own exper personal experiences to help others that are struggling with their alcohol addictions. After further meetings with the police, they suggested that I contacted the Derbyshire Drug and Alcohol Action Team to see if they could offer me anything in my newfound desire to help others. I learned a lot here that it felt strange being in meetings where the people I had been against for, for my life up to now were sat around the table. I learned a lot here for the nine months I volunteered but still felt there was something missing and I needed to do more. I, was a very hand, I am a very hands-on type of person so I needed to do something else. One meeting I went to, I started talking to someone afterwards. They said to me, Gary, you have lots of personal experience and know a lot about the alcohol field. Why don't you try and set something up? I thought she, without rude, was drunk saying that to me. <laughs> I mean, me running my own thing to help others, I nonetheless nodded at what I thought was her pie in the sky idea and told her I would. Not having a clue why she said it, I went home and sat there in deep thought. Could I really do something? What would it be like? What name could I use? These were questions, along with many others, that were now running through my head. What I managed after a few months when I fi finally made sense of all the questions that I kept asking myself was to realise I needed a bit of funding to start everything up. I then went on to spend hours upon hours looking for a place that would give me some initial funding to start things up. And as you all know, asking people for money is no easy feat. At times I felt like giving up, but the fact that I had given up on most thing, other things in my life and my daughter and wanted to do a proud, this spurred me on. Eventually I came across a place where so I phoned them, explained what I wanted to do, and they sent me an application form to apply for funding from them to start up what is now known as the Free From Addiction Project. 